Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Wilden, and it is my honor and pleasure to be the executive director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the Berkshire Community College. We are very, very honored to present this live conversation with the true civil rights hero, attorney Fred Gray, in conversation with OLLI member and instructor, Doug Mishkin. OLLI provides educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people 50 years and better. We believe the knowledge and insight and creativity of older adults is something to be celebrated and shared. One of the most wonderful things about OLLI is that the programs we offer are developed and often taught by our members themselves. To that end, we are especially grateful to Doug Mishkin for proposing and putting together this extraordinary opportunity, opportunity to hear from a true fighter for justice and an active participant in our nation's history. Doug Mishkin is a lawyer himself, as well as a folk singer, but that's another story. Uh, he serves low and moderate income clients in cases involving tenants' rights, employee rights, employment and housing discrimination, and consumer protection cases. His practice includes litigating landmark pro bono cases for the Washington Law Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs, and for Americans United for Separation of Church and State. And he is the recipient of numerous super lawyers and similar awards from legal publications. It is my honor to introduce Doug Mishkin, who will introduce our special guest tonight, Mr. Fred Gray. Doug? Congressman John Lewis called Fred Gray one of the founding fathers of modern America. In his introduction to Fred Gray's autobiography, Congressman Lewis wrote, we can learn much from this courageous man. For the next 90 minutes, that's what we're gonna do. In 1955, when Fred Gray was 24 and in his second year practicing law, he represented Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Montgomery bus boycott. Stop right there. Had he done nothing else, that alone would have earned Fred Gray a place in the American civil rights pantheon, indeed in the pantheon of modern American history. But in his first 10 years of practice, Fred Gray played a significant role in four landmark cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, he argued one of those cases, Gamillion versus Lightfoot, the case that made the law prohibiting racial gerrymandering of political districts. But today's program is about more than history. It's about what Fred Gray is doing today to address ongoing racism, particularly in our healthcare system, and specifically how the legacy of the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study impedes our response to the pandemic within the African-American community. Toward the end of this program, you'll hear about how Mr. Gray sued and obtained recovery from the US government on behalf of the 623 victims of the syphilis study, how he helped procure President Clinton's apology to those victims, and how Fred then created the Tuskegee History Center, which now carries on the work of addressing African-American suspicion of our healthcare system generally, and specifically suspicion about the COVID vaccines. We're posting a link to the center's website in the chat function throughout the program. And at the end of the program, we'll put it on the screen. Before you hear about Fred Gray's contributions to justice, let me do an injustice to his biography, very briefly summarized. He was the president of the National Bar Association, the oldest and largest national network of predominantly African-American lawyers and judges. He was the first African-American president of the Alabama State Bar Association. He has received numerous awards from, among others, the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the American Bar Association, the Congressional Black Caucus, and Harvard Law School. 
He holds numerous honorary degrees, including from Case Western Reserve University Law School, his alma mater. For you legal beagles, Fred is also a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and of the International Society of Barristers. Uh, the challenge today is so many important cases, so little time. If it feels to you like we are not talking enough about any particular case, you're right. I plead guilty to going for breadth, not depth. In early March 2020, my wife and I and two friends visited the Tuskegee History Center. While there, I bought Fred's autobiography aptly titled Bus Ride to Justice. As I read it, I thought, I want to hear this man tell the stories of the cases and the people that he wrote about in the book. And I wanted all of you to hear from him as well. And so it is my privilege and my honor to introduce you to Fred Gray. Fred, thanks for being with us. We need to unmute Fred. Thank you very much, Doug. All right. Thanks to the college for inviting me to participate in your program. You have quite a program. We are happy that you came to the center and we are happy to participate in this program and to share my life story. Well, we appreciate it, Fred. So as we say, let's get down to cases. December 14th, 1930, you're born in Montgomery, Alabama, the heart of the segregated South. Can you take just a minute and set that scene for us? Everything was completely segregated in Montgomery when I was born. I am the youngest of five children. My father died when I was two. I don't remember him. My mother had very little formal education. She worked as a domestic worker in white people kitchen. Everything was segregated, but she told the five of us that we could be anything we wanted to be if we did three things. One, keep Christ first in our lives. Two, stay in school and get a good education. And three, stay out of trouble. I tried to do that. So uh, you've said that as a young boy, you wanted to be a preacher or a teacher. And you went to Alabama State College for Negroes, now known as Alabama State University. But while you were in college, you decided to become a lawyer and you came up with a secret mission. What was the secret mission? My secret mission, I observed because I had to ride the public transportation to and from school. I saw African-Americans who were being mistreated on the buses. I recognized then that everything in Montgomery was completely separated based on race and that African-Americans were not being treated. I had to been told that lawyers help individuals and render, help them to solve problems. I thought that we had a problem in Montgomery being mistreated on the buses and segregated. So I concluded, and I kept it secret for about 40 years, that I would uh, finish Alabama State, go to somebody's law school someplace, and at that time, if you didn't do your graduate work and professional work at the white school, University of Alabama and all, but that they would pay a portion of your tuition room and board. I would take advantage of that, go to law school, finish law school, come back to Alabama, take the bar exam, pass the bar exam and destroy everything segregated I could find. And I had that desire while an upper teenager in Montgomery, Alabama, between 1947 and 1951. So it's September 7th, 1954. You opened your own law office in Montgomery. You're 24 years old. And I've read that you started attending meetings of the NAACP, and there was a woman who was the secretary of the Montgomery branch and its youth director. 
and she is a little older than you, but you and she became friends. Her name was? Rosa Parks. Mrs. Sorry. Parks, uh, I, I had known from my college days because I was interested in civil rights and she was secretary to the Montgomery branch of the NAACP. And also she was the director of the youth conference. So I had gone some time to her meetings and uh, she encouraged me also to become a lawyer. And when I came back to Montgomery and she assisted in opening the office, uh, she was working at the Montgomery Fair of the apartment store uh, about a block and a half from where my office was located on Monroe Street, which was the business street in Montgomery where most African-Americans had their offices. And uh, she would come from her, uh, from her store to my office and we would sit down and have lunch. We would talk about all the problems that existed. We talked about segregation. We talked about the buses and it hadn't been long since Brown versus the Board of Education had been decided. And uh, then later on, when Claudette Carvin, if you want to get there, uh, I'll wait on you. Well, I was going to say Rosa Parks was not your first civil rights case. That was a 15 year old uh, young girl, Claudette Calvin, who got arrested for not giving up her seat on a bus. But I, I do want to move us along and I want to get us to December 1, 1955, because you say that you had lunch with Rosa Parks that day and you went back to work and she, uh, I'm sorry, she went back to work and you left for an out of town engagement. And then what happened next? What happened uh, on December well, 1st? Of course, uh, we talked that day and had our usual meeting. She knew I was going out of town and she ended up uh, getting arrested. What we had talked about in our meetings, what a person should do in the event they were asked to give up their seat. And if they decided they didn't want to, what type of person would it be? And both of us concluded without saying it, that she possessed all of those qualities. And while she never told me that she was going to do it, I knew, or I believe that if the opportunity ever presented itself, she was not going to get up. And she did not get up that day. When I got back, I had a phone call. I had phone calls from a lot of people, including one from Mrs. Parks. And when I returned the call, she told me she'd been arrested at this time. She had been uh, bonded out by Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Silver Rice. He was president of the uh, Montgomery branch of the NAACP. And she had invited me over to her house and I went over and talked with her. She told me about the arrest. This is on a Thursday. And her trial was set for the following Monday at 8.30 in the recorder's court of the city of Montgomery. And she wanted me to represent her. I told her that I would represent her. And uh, we have been having problems on the buses for a long time. And I told her that we need to really solve these problems. But I also reminded her that Joanne Robinson, who was a teacher at Alabama State, who had had an altercation on the bus some years earlier, back in 1948, that she felt that the community needed to get involved. So I told Ms. Parks, don't worry about your case. I'll be back in touch with you between now and Monday, and we'll be ready for the trial on Monday. But I'm going to go and talk to Mr. Nixon and see what he think about what Mrs. Uh, Robinson has been talking about getting the community involved. Because if we're going to get them involved, now is the time to get them involved. So I left her house and went to Mr. Nixon's house, which was only a few blocks away. And I talked to him. Mr. Nixon was a, a Pullman car porter. 
he was in town three days and then he was on the road on the trains for three days. And uh, he was an action man. He wasn't uh, very much at planning. I told him, reminded him about Joanne. And he says, well, you and Miss Robinson, go ahead and talk, let me know. And uh, I'll support whatever you decide. I left his house and went over to Joanne Robinson's house. She lives on the other side of town where Alabama State was located, the more affluent part of the town for African-Americans. And uh, I talked with her and she said, well, Fred, if we're going to ever get the community involved, we need to get them involved now. And I said, well, that's fine. She says, uh, but we're not going to be able to tell these people to stay off of the bus till you get a lawsuit ready. I said, well, and we concluded that what we were going to do was going to ask the people to stay off of the bus for one day and then meet at a church and we'll decide where we go from that Monday night after the trial. Well, we said, well, if we're going to do that, while we're talking about uh, staying off for one day, if they stay off, we're gonna to have to be prepared for longer than that. So what we had to do in her living room was to make some plans. And we said, well, one thing we're gonna to need to have is a spokesman, because if you're gonna stay off of the buses, somebody has got to be the spokesman. And Joanne said, well, I tell you who we should get. She said, my pastor. Martin Luther King Jr. just got in town a little better than a year ago, haven't been involved in any civil rights activities, but one thing he can do is move people with words. I said, well, that's what we need. So we said, fine. I said, well, there are two other blacks in the community who had followers. E.G. Nixon was one follower and Rufus Lewis who was an educated man. He had been a coach at Alabama State. He believed in and had a nightclub called the Citizens Club. And the only way you could get in the Citizens Club, you had to be a registered voter. So, uh, but what does registered voting have to do with keeping people off the buses? I said, Mr. Lewis wife, Jewel, is co-owner of the largest funeral home in town. They have automobiles. If we go more than a day, we're gonna need some cars and she can get them to do it. Well, I said, I'll tell you, E.D. Nixon, let's make him treasurer because he is a member of the Pullman Car Potters Union. I will, A. A. Philip Randolph is the chairman and he can get Mr. Randolph up in New York to raise some money and help us keep it going until the lawsuit's over. Because ultimately, we're gonna to have to file a lawsuit. We concluded in Joanne's living room that we would recommend to the community to make Martin Luther King the spokesman, E.D. Nixon the treasurer, Rufus Lewis would be the chairman of the transportation committee and you need a lawyer. So the young lawyer just out of law school will be the lawyer. When Mrs. Park's trial was over, and I want you to know that if Claudette Carvin, the 14 year old girl, if she had not done what she did on March 2nd, 1955, Mrs. Parks may not have done what she did on December the 5th, 1955. That 15 year old girl gave Joanne Robinson and Rosa Parks and E.D. Nixon and Fred Gray and, and uh, Martin Luther King and the other adults gave us the courage to do what we do. And when we had the trial of Mrs. Parks and we knew they were gonna find a guilty and when we made the bonds and when we met at Hope Street Baptist Church that night, and when we listened to Dr. King speak, Joanne and I sat and said, well, we know what we decided was right. 
And that was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted for 382 days. Oh, Fred, there were a total of five different lawsuits that arose from uh, the, the bus boycott. The Rosa Parks trial was the first of them. And as you say, it was quick and you knew she was gonna lose. In February, 1956, you filed the lawsuit Browder versus Gale, uh, demanding full integration of the buses. And that's a case that went to the Supreme Court. And you won that one. Can you give us a, a quick summary of, of how that happened? Well, because Rosa Parks' case was, they just charged her, uh, in effect, with uh, disorderly conduct. Uh, they would not charge her with violating the city and the state's segregation laws because that would have given us an opportunity to try it. But uh, so her case, uh, we tried it. She was convicted, fined $10. We appealed it. But the laws were still on the books. So we had to file a lawsuit. And when the community was ready, and that was about in February of, of, of 56, we filed the lawsuit of Browder versus Gill. Uh, I did not include Mrs. Parks in that case because her case was going up on appeal in the state court system. And I didn't want them if we had 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 her as a plaintiff to say that this was a collateral attack on this case in the state court system. But I did include Claudette Carden because I knew she had the courage and her parents had retained me earlier. I was still representing her. So that was a part of it. But on the case of Browder versus Gale, Mrs. Browder was a nice, matured lady, a person I thought who would make a good witness to be lead off with the plaintiff case, and she had had a problem. And we filed that lawsuit, had a three-judge court because we were challenging the constitutionality of the state statute, was able to get that uh, decision, and ultimately it was a appeal to the Supreme Court and we filed a motion to affirm the lower court and Judge Johnson and Judge Reeves and a district court judge from Birmingham with the three judges in that court. And that was the beginning of, or uh, that was the end of segregation on the buses. But what was very important about this whole movement is that the fact that African-Americans were able to stay off of the bus for that long period of time. And when other African-Americans saw it, they said, if they could stay off of the buses in Montgomery and solve the problems, then whatever our problems are, we can solve them. Fred, I, I wanna move on to talk about the Gamillion case because it's so important. But before we do that, I just want people who are watching and listening to understand, in addition to filing the Browder case and, and winning that ultimately in the Supreme Court, uh, during the boycott, the city of Montgomery arrested 89 people for violating the anti-boycott statute. And you uh, eventually got uh, the one case that was brought among those indictments against Dr. King you got that dismissed. Then there was a lawsuit by the city against the Montgomery Improvement Association, the organization that ran the boycott. Uh, the city tried to get an injunction to stop the carpooling that was going on for people who weren't riding the buses. But when you won the Browder case, that lawsuit went away. And then there was the lawsuit brought by the state of Alabama against the NAACP to try to stop the NAACP from doing business in Alabama. That case went to the Supreme Court and that's a whole story by itself, but I just think people ought to know that the state originally got an injunction against the NAACP. They wanted the names of the NAACP members. NAACP said no good. And the Supreme Court said, state of Alabama loses. 
Browder versus Gale was filed, I think, about the 2nd of February of 56. Right. Uh, the first part of July, uh, John Patterson, then the Attorney General, filed a suit against the NAACP. He thought that the NAACP was really the organization that was sponsoring the boycott. And if he could get them out of the way, that his problems would, would be over. And he was also contemplating running for governor during the next term. But, uh, and then he wanted the names of, of our members, the NACP members. And we, they knew that if those names were given, those people would have lost their jobs and a lot of other things would have been a pressure brought against them. So we refused to do it. They were fine. Then they cited us for contempt of court. Had to go up to the Supreme Court on at least four or five different times before we finally won that case, which was very important to the NAACP. Yes. So Fred, I want to take us now to October 18th, 1960, because I want to talk about another case of yours that went to the Supreme Court. This is one that you argued. And I want to say to our audience, uh, what you're looking at is a map of the city of Tuskegee. And in a minute, I'm going to have Fred explain to you what the map shows. But I want all of us first to listen, because what you're going to hear is a recording of the oral argument in the US Supreme Court on this case. The first voice you're gonna hear is Chief Justice Earl Warren. Then you're gonna hear Fred Gray, and then you're going to hear Justice Frankfurter ask an important question. It may be a little hard to hear. We'll repeat for you uh, what these people are saying, but I thought you might enjoy hearing the original. Number 32, C.G. Gamillion, and our petitioners versus Phil M. Lightfoot, who's mayor of the city of Tuskegee. Mr. Gray, we feel that the facts in this case, as alleged in the complaint, are so important that we have <laughs> an enlarged copy of the exhibit two that is attached to the complaint which appears on page 13, 10 years, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure. years to do that. The yes, two is here, northwest corner. It is no longer in the city. It's now outside. It is now outside, yes. Well, so here's the map. You heard Justice Frankfurter ask, where is the Tuskegee Institute? And Fred said, it's in the northwest corner. And Justice Frankfurter says, it's no longer within the city of Tuskegee, which is the, the new map that the city had come up with. And Fred answered, yes, the, the Tuskegee Institute is now no longer in the city of Tuskegee. Fred, you called uh, Chameleon versus Lightfoot perhaps the most important civil rights case that you handled. Tell us a bit about it. I think it was an important case. You, you have to understand the demographics of the city of Tuskegee and Tuskegee Institute to understand. Uh, the city, the, the county of Macon, of which Tuskegee is the county seat, has always had about 80% of its population was African Americans. And unlike most of those agricultural counties of which Macon was one, there were two major institutions in Tuskegee that Blacks were operating and they were highly educated. You had Tuskegee Institute, where Booker T. Washington was the first principal, and an internationally famous institution for African Americans. Then you had the VA hospital, which came into being as a result of World War I and there was no place for blacks to be treated and Tuskegee Institute gave to the government uh, 500 acres of land if they would build a hospital in order for blacks to be there. So you had that hospital that was there, it was controlled by blacks, highly educated, 
you had Tuskegee Institute, but they couldn't get the right to vote. So there was an election and they had been filing lawsuits ever since 1945 to get the right to vote. The voter registrars, whenever they would meet, would hide so that blacks couldn't get registered. They had a lot of other things. So when a municipal election was coming up where African-Americans could not have elected a person, but they could have and would have been able to, to control who got elected. So what happened? The state legislature passed a bill changing the city limits from a square, as you can see, to what I described in my brief, a 28 side sea dragon going out to include uh, whites, going in to exclude blacks. And I thought if we could show that to the court, if anything could convince Mr. Justice Frankfurter, who we had to get against this case of Cole Gold versus Green, which he had said would stay out of the political thicket, it would. So I was delighted to hear uh, Mr. Justice Frank Frutter inquire, where was Tuskegee Institute? And I pointed to him and told him, uh, here is Tuskegee Institute. And he says, Tuskegee Institute is, is still in the city of Tuskegee, isn't it? I said, no, sir, Mr. Justice, it was, but it's out. I think that got Mr. Justice Frank Frutter's vote and got us to the unanimous Supreme Court and that case, Gomillion v. Lightfoot, and other cases which use it as a precedent, set the stage for single member district and, and uh, a lot of other basic principles involving the right to vote. And it all started in Macon County, Alabama and in Tuskegee with that case. Fred, when you called the NAACP Legal Defense Fund about this case, what did they, when you were contemplating filing it, what did they say to you? Well, they didn't think, uh, well, Robert Carter was the person who, who uh, I, I talked with. And it goes back to initially, I realized when the bus boycott started that I needed some help. I called Mr. Thurgood Marshall, who later became a justice on the Supreme Court. And say, can I come to court, come to New York, bring my little complaint, and can you and your assistants help us, these black people, he had been reading about it, and he helped it. So that was the beginning. He really assigned it to Bob Carter, who was his assistant. And he helped me with Browder versus Gale and that other legal work. But then, a few months later, when the state of Alabama sued the NAACP, then Bob Carter got me to help him defend that case. Then when Gomillion came along and I explained it to Bob, he said, Fred, how in the world are you gonna be able to get around uh, uh, Frank Frederick's uh, opinion? I said, just like we did the other, we're gonna file a suit for uh, a declaratory judgment and injunctive relief, ask the court to declare this act to be unconstitutional, then the city limits will automatically remain where they are. And he says, well, I don't think you can win it, but I'm going to be in Houston, Texas on a certain day. And if you come out there, bring it to me, I'll see what I could do. And I went out, nobody thought but me that we could win go million, but we did win it. And I think Mr. Justice Frank Furter's comments led the court to where it went. And just so people understand what you were up against, when uh, there had been a Supreme Court decision in the Colgrove case that said redistricting is generally just a political matter, courts won't get involved. So you had to get around that and show it may be politics, but it can't be racial. It can't violate the Constitution. And that's what Gamillion did for US constitutional law. I, I'd like to point out, you, you've noted in your book, as a result of winning the Gamillion case, Johnny Ford became the first African-American mayor of Tuskegee. 
and all the members of the Tuskegee City Council are now African American. Uh, so you went from suing the mayor and the city council of Tuskegee to being the lawyer for the mayor of Tuskegee and the city council. Uh, I, I like a happy ending like that. I want to move us along uh, to another fascinating case that I suspect most people have not heard of. In February of 1960, Dr. King was arrested on a charge of perjury arising out of his 1956 and 1958 Alabama tax returns. He was indicted for the felony of perjury. You, were, you represented him and you won. Can you tell us just quickly about that case? Uh, yes, the tax case, uh, I don't know, other than the fact that John Patterson uh, was interested in running for governor and felt that anything that he, if he could get a conviction against uh, 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 Dr. King, it would stop the civil rights movement because see, Dr. King has now left Montgomery and he left Montgomery because uh, he had accomplished what the bus boycott was designed to accomplish, started the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference which gave another civil rights organization to be out there. And I think that Governor Patterson felt if they could get King out of the way, it would probably stop the civil rights movement that was gaining momentum. It was a very important case. And uh, Dr. King was now living over in Atlanta. So he was able to get a committee that got a group of lawyers together that included Bob Ming from Chicago, judge, former judge Delaney from uh, uh, New York. And I was one of the local lawyers. And, and uh, so to me, and, and we took this to be a very serious case. We filed every type of preliminary motion we thought we could file, including systematically excluding blacks from the jury. We got one of the best uh, CPAs in the country, who was a member of a CPA organization, an international organization with uh, headquarters in London from Atlanta. And he came over and testified. And the, uh, uh, we got a break in the case because the state revenue agent was an honest man. He had gone through Dr. King's uh, returns and had told Dr. King during the course of it that he didn't see anything wrong with it. But the indictment came back anyway. But our, we still had an all white jury in Montgomery, Alabama in 1960 in the middle of a lot of city and demonstrations going on. And we didn't have the slightest idea that we would win that case. We were prepared to appeal as we were prepared on all of those cases. If Dr. King had lost that case, it questioned his credibility. They would have said, well, he's talking about civil rights and uh, social justice. He's cheating on his income tax. That was a Vietnam war that was going on at the time. And it would have, if they could get King out of the way, and he already had that NAACP case was still lurking around in the courts, but the Lord would have it and was with us. It developed that when they returned a not guilty verdict in the middle of the civil rights movement in Montgomery, it really gave Dr. King and freed him. And I think it, well, they didn't discuss it very much. 
I think it freed him of a lot of burdens that he was then free of that yoke. So it was and, a very and, important case. And your victory in that case uh, explains why uh, uh, most people haven't heard about it. Uh, yeah, had Dr. Okay. King been convicted, the history of the movement would have been different, uh, but uh, great victory. And as a result, it's not well known. I want to I want to move us ahead to March seventh, nineteen sixty five, Bloody Sunday. At John Lewis, Hosea Williams, and others, they start marching from Selma to Montgomery on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They're beaten and tear gassed. The history is well known. You filed a lawsuit in federal court to try to get them protection. I'd like you to tell people the story of your interaction with Judge Frank M. Johnson, the U.S. District Court judge who heard this case and many other of the civil rights cases that you filed. A prelude to getting to Judge Johnson was the fact that these people were beaten back on Bloody Sunday when all they were trying to do is just to march across the bridge and go on to Montgomery. And John Lewis was included in that. He wasn't really the lead person at that time, Jose William was. He was a young boy on the, on the court. And we had met John Lewis before because uh, he had written Dr. King and wanted to go, wanted to desegregate the community college in his area. But when they beat him back on Bloody Sunday, I was living in Montgomery then and they called me and wanted me to come to Selma to talk to them after they had been beaten. And I knew all these state troopers was over there, but I told them I'd come. I went and they told me, said, well, lawyer, we think we have a constitutional right to march and protest to Selma, to Montgomery, to right to vote. However, We've been beaten once. We don't want to be beaten again. And we thought we would call you and see if you couldn't file a lawsuit or do something to help us so we'll be able to go from Selma to Montgomery. I told them I thought it could. They retained me. And I left. Uh, called all my folks. That was before cell phone times and got my little help up. And we worked the rest of Sunday night and all day Monday and filed a lawsuit before the close of day on Monday in terms of Jose Williams uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, Aurelia Browder, Browder, not Browder, but uh, Boyington and of course, uh, Congressman John Lewis and others against the governor of the state because he had control of the state troopers. And uh, after filing that suit on Tuesday, late, mon late Monday evening, Tuesday morning, I received a phone call from Jerry Johnson's office. Well, I had a little dealing with Judge Johnson. He was a very strict judge, and I knew about him from uh, Browder versus Gale and from NACP versus Alabama, uh, and from uh, Goldmillion versus Lightfoot. He was the only federal district judge in the Middle District of Alabama at the time. And so uh, <clears throat> he, I went to his office at the appointed time. And he says, lawyer, he wore glasses, and he looked over his glasses and says, uh, you filed a lawsuit in this case, and you say you allege that your client's constitutional rights have been violated. If they have been violated, the court going to grant you relief. If the court find that they have been violated, it's not going to grant you relief. He says, you have filed a motion for temporary restraining order in this case, which I'm going to deny. 
You have also filed a motion for a preliminary injunction in this case, which I'm going to set for a hearing on Thursday. Now, this is, this is Tuesday. He says, I have heard, and most judges don't talk about what they've heard. <laughs> he said, I, I, I hear that your clients over in Selma, after having invoked the jurisdiction of this court, are going to still march across the bridge and go on to Montgomery and not give the court an opportunity to rule on it. And he says, I don't want them to do that. And I have issued an injunction in joining them from doing it. And their leaders will be served later on today. I tried to tell the judge that you don't understand these people in the movement. They think about a higher authority. He says, Mr. Gray, you are officer of the court. Control your clients. I left. I found Dr. King over in Selma. I didn't want to talk to anybody but him. I said, Martin, this case is the most important case that we have in the civil rights movement. And the judge has set it for a hearing day after tomorrow. I need to be getting it ready so we can try to win it. But the marshal is going to be here after a while and going to serve you with a copy of the judge's order. I want a commitment from you that you will not go across that bridge toward going to Montgomery. And uh, I said, I don't have time for a lot of talk. I don't know how you're going to do it. He said, well, Fred, you know, all these people have come in here from all over the country and they want to march. I said, well, there's a lot of space in the city of Selma to march, but don't let them march cross the bridge. He gave me his commitment. He says, Fred, you have my word. I left. That's all I needed because I had to go and get a case prepared. So then, if you see, if you've seen the, the the story about the movie about the, the Selma to Montgomery March, you see the state troopers come up from one side all, on, on Tuesday later on. And they then go back. You see Martin. And the other group come back on the other side and stay and they have a prayer and they go back, not across the bridge, but they go to the church and have a meeting. So when each one of those groups realized, now I don't know what Dr. King told them and I never asked them and I didn't need to know, but I know that each side recognized that the matter was in the judge's hand and he was going to decide it and none of them needed to be there. It ended up and we had to uh, go uh, that case and tried it for almost a week. Then the attorney general was telling the court that he was going to appeal. So he, the judge ended up calling all the lawyers in that day and say, now I understand, uh, Mr. Attorney General, that you all are gonna appeal this case. If you're gonna appeal it, you're gonna have to appeal it now because I have a panel waiting to, dis to hear the case in New Orleans this evening at six o'clock. And this was nine o'clock in the morning. It ended up, we were all down there. We had the hearing, we had the hearing and the court ended up uh, affirming Jerry Johnson, the march took place. And as a result of the march, the Voting Rights Act was passed and many thousands of African-Americans have had the right to vote and many elected as a result of it. Quite a story. I don't imagine there are a lot of people who ever said to Dr. King, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you. I have to make this brief. Fred, I, I wanna move on 
and uh, have you talk about the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, case. But before we do that, because in the interest of time, uh, I, I just want our listeners to understand about a whole body of other cases that you tried. We've talked uh, tonight about these well-known situations, but you got involved in a long list of cases about uh, education and the court system and the political process. And I know there are law students who are watching and listening with us and your homework is to go back and find these cases like Dixon versus Alabama State Board of Education, Franklin versus Parker, Gunn versus Norton. That's one of my favorites. Uh, uh, Wendell Gunn got admitted to the Florida State College despite the school president saying there was no authority to enroll a Negro student. It was a 10 minute trial. At the end of the trial, the judge ordered that he be admitted and the president then drove Wendell Gunn to the campus. Strain versus Philpot, Knight versus Alabama, Lee versus Macon County, uh, uh, Carr versus Montgomery County, Mitchell versus Johnston, Sellers versus Trussell, Smith versus Paris, Henderson versus Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Services. These are all cases that you brought to remove barriers, remove segregation from schools, from jury selection, from federal government programs that served uh, farmers, but were discriminating against African-American uh, farmers. And they're an important part of your legal legacy uh, that could give rise to an entirely separate program. And all of those cases were filed pursuant to my secret commitment that later became public that I would destroy everything segregated I could find. I got over into Tuskegee and found out I'd have a jury of a liar of 100 people and only two or three looked like me, color-wise. So we filed a case of Mitchell versus the Jury Commission of Macon County, which was the first case dealing with uh, the right to serve on juries in the civil cases. We uh, found, and Macon County is an agricultural town, and most of the people are farmers, but the farm subsidies, they had communities there and people were selected in the communities and blacks were discriminated against them. So we filed a case of Henderson versus Macon County ASCS committee in order that these farmers could have proper because these communities would decide, these community boards would decide which farmers got what subsidies. So it was very important. And that case laid the foundation for other cases that about two or three years ago, where millions of dollars was paid out to the heirs of black farmers whose parents were discriminated against and not given loans as white farmers were. And that was uh, in Henderson versus, versus them. Uh, if you want to talk about the school cases, I have cases from elementary school all the way up to including professional and graduate school. We used to have to go and file the lawsuits one by one. And in 1963, nothing was integrated in Alabama. In the higher educations, we filed a suit against the University of Alabama, the national football champs now. But we filed a suit, Vivian Malone and Hood against University of Alabama in 63 which opened the door so African-Americans could attend that university. We filed a case of uh, Franklin versus Auburn that desegregated Auburn University, the land grant college or uh, university. We filed Gunn versus uh, Norton. Uh, that was the suit now against what was North University of North Alabama. So all of the schools of higher education 
And then we even found later when it came down uh, to the Knight case that you still had discrimination in higher education. So we were involved uh, in that case. Uh, that takes care, then on the elementary and, and, and secondary level, we used to have to file uh, every school board. And in all of these uh, states, you have 50 or 60 school boards from city to county. But when we filed the suit in Tuskegee, Levy Macon, Governor Wallace now is governor, and he sent the state troopers over there to stop integration of the schools. I decided that if the governor could stop the integration of the school with the state troopers, then the state superintendent of education who has tremendous power and authority over all these school boards and the school board and the state superint and the state uh, uh, school board could uh, we make them parties, make the governor parties, and ask them to desegregate not only all the school systems in the state, but everything under the control of the state board of education. Nothing like that has been filed before, not since various cases out of that Lee case, I bet you over two or three dozen cases have gone all the way, I know up to the state Supreme Court and, and to the Alabama and to the US Supreme Court. But it took us about four or five years to do it, but ultimately it, it took place. Fred, I wanna bring us up to July 27th, 1972 a man named Charlie Pollard came to your office. What happened as a result? Uh, Charlie Pollard came to my office. I knew him. He was a farmer from Notasoga, about 10, 15 miles north of uh, Tuskegee. A very progressive farmer and was one of the first blacks or first persons in the county to have a cotton picker years ago. But anyway, he came in the office on, uh, I think it was the 27th of July in 72. And he had a paper and said, lawyer, I don't know whether you have read this story or not, but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it tells about uh, some men who was in a story, in a, in a study that the federal government was using them in. And I was, I'm one of those men and I think my government has done me wrong. Uh, can you help me? And I told him, I think I can. Well, I was familiar with what he was talking about because a couple of days earlier, I had bought a newspaper while I was in Washington, DC at the airport. And in the flight down, I read this story by Gene Heller, AP reporter about these black men in Macon County, Alabama, who had been used as guinea pigs in a program by the federal government. And I said, well, I've been living in Macon County for a while now. I didn't know anything about it, hadn't heard anything about it, but uh, I wanted to know. So when he came in, that was uh, uh, just like a light bulb in my mind because I was happy for him to be there. I was happy for him to retain me because I wanted to do something about it. That was my introduction to that case. And I've been working on, and I filed a lawsuit for them a year later, Charlie W. Pollard et al. versus the United States of America et al. And uh, it still exists from then until now. There was a lot of problems involved in that case. Uh, number one, we had a problem with discovery. Once we filed a lawsuit and we filed for discovery, the government responded and said, we know there are some records somewhere, but we don't know where they are. 
And without the records, how can we prove it? These people had very, they would have just a little piece of paper that they would get every now and then when these doctors would come. I received a phone call from a man in Washington who called me, said, my name is Jim Jones. And he said, I understand you represent those men who was involved in this study. And he said, I think I have something that you want. I said, what is it, sir? He says, I know where the records are that you're looking for. I said, yes, sir, I do know. And he told me, I got on a plane and went to Washington and we went up and found those records in over 400 boxes at the National Archives. And they had all of these records telling the story and the government was really embarrassed by it. And they got to a point where they were willing to at least talk about some type of settlement. We were able finally get, to get that case settled. Then we found that there was a group of people who wanted an apology made to these men. Well, these men, when they came to me, basically they were concerned about trying to get some money if they could. And since they had a health care program and a death benefit program that the government was was giving them when they died, they wanted that to continue. So uh, I was able to get that included and get a little money for them as much as you can get out of the federal government. But then when this group came, they didn't talk to me. They didn't talk to the men about what they wanted to do, but they were trying to get an apology for them. And I said, well, now these people are kind of doing similar to what the government did. Uh, they, all they had to do was to tell us they know we were involved in it, but that didn't bother me. I decided that I would get with them and then I decided to do something else. We ended up finding <clears throat> that that was a, <clears throat> excuse me, Miss Elvis Boys came out, which was a movie about the story. And these men were projected as being persons in in restaurants and kind of junk junk men and as boys. But I showed them that and we decided that they were not boys, they were men. So they wanted us to do something to let the nation know that Ms. Elvis boys was not a correct description of what they were involved in. And I said at the same time, if we can have a press conference and get national media there and let them hear these men's story, not my story, but their story, maybe we can do something. That took place on April the 8th of 97. And it ended up being the headlines that evening. I received a phone call from Bob Johnson in the uh, president's office saying that the president was making apology and they did, and he did make an apology to these men so, later on. So you got a monetary recovery. Now I want people to take a look. Uh, May 16th, 1997 at the White House. And I encourage everyone who's uh, with us now, go to YouTube and watch this entire ceremony. It's about 35 minutes. Uh, of course, we can't uh, play much of it. But one of the survivors, uh, Herman Shaw, who you see on the screen, at this time, he was just a few days short of his 95th birthday. He invoked the other survivors of the syphilis study and the memory of the deceased participants. And then he said this. President Herman. Uh, we too also want to thank our lawyer, Attorney Fred Bray. Then President Clinton spoke. And he recognized Fred by uh, saying, a great friend of freedom, Fred Gray, thank you for fighting this long battle for all these years. 
And then President Clinton said, What was done cannot be undone, but we can turn aside. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look at you in the eye and finally say on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful and I am sorry. So Fred, you have said the men wanted three things. They wanted money, you got them that. They wanted a presidential apology, you helped get them that. And they wanted one more thing. Well, they wanted something. They wanted a permanent memorial in Tuskegee so that people would be able to come, learn the facts about the situation. And they asked me to help them do it. But I didn't know anything about museums. But I told them that if life lasts and the Lord permits me, we will help you build that permanent memorial. That was 22 years ago. I want you to know that there is, and you are looking at a building, we were able to get a bank to give to them. And in that building, it houses, when you go in it, there's a big chandelier in the center of the building and underneath that sand chandelier is the name of all 623 of those men. Behind that, and in the center is the style of the case, Charlotte W. Pollard et al. versus the United States of America et al. Behind it is a chaos on three sides to give you information about it. And on one of the sides, you have the, you can see and hear the whole apology that took place. And around, up around the around the balcony, there are pictures of the men in the study. Some of their names we don't know and we're still looking for them, but they're there. But truly that museum is a permanent memorial for that, those men. But in addition to that, it does two other basic things. And one, it serves to educate the public on the contributions made by the three ethnic groups that has made not only Macon County, but this country, Native Americans, Americans of European descent, and Americans of African descent. There is a way wall which begins from pre-existing time. Above that wall shows uh, uh, a, a, a rough uh, title of the area and what the people were doing. Uh, the global that separates the upper part from the lower, the upper part tells you what was going on in Macon County, the lower part, the rest of the world, and that brings you up to date and it brings you all the way up to modern time. Then the last part is a brief history of the civil rights movement and what African-Americans have had to go through from slavery time to date. You'll find uh, citations for and something about all of the civil rights cases, all of the uh, uh, federal laws. And then the last wall over there is a wall about residents of Macon County, Alabama, and the four or five cases that they have filed that not only helped Macon County, but has helped people all over this nation. So then you have, and we want you to come and visit it. And not only do we want you to come and visit it, but we want you to support it. Unfortunately, we don't have any permanent support, but we, work toward everything so that those men will know and their heirs come and people can learn and know about it. We are living now at a time when just about uh, three generations of people don't know anything about hardcore segregation. 
But if you come to that museum and other museums, you'll be able to see it. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, we're going to take some questions from the chat box, and then I'm going to offer Fred the opportunity to close our program with a few remarks from him. But before we do that, uh, I want to thank uh, Deborah Gray, Fred's daughter, who directs the museum, without whom this program uh, would not have happened. I want to thank uh, three law professors, uh, Jonathan Enton of Case Western Reserve University Law School, Len Rabinowitz of Northwestern University Law School, and uh, uh, Randall Kennedy of uh, Harvard Law School for their scholarship that uh, one way or another shines a light on Fred Gray's legal contributions. But of course, I want to thank today's guest. Professor Eddie Gloud of Princeton wrote in his book, Begin Again, the American idea is indeed in trouble. It should be. Revealing the lie at the heart of the American idea, however, occasions an opportunity to tell a different and a better story. It affords us a chance to excavate the past and to examine the ruins to find or at least glimpse what made us who we are. Gloud says that James Baldwin insisted until he died that we reach for a different story. We should tell the truth about ourselves, he maintained, and that would release us into a new possibility. Fred, in destroying everything segregated you could find, you told us the truth about ourselves. You helped write a different and better story. In so doing, you released all of us into a new possibilities. You're a preacher, that's what preachers can do. You're a teacher, that's what teachers can do. And sometimes that's what a trial lawyer can do, for which I take the privilege to say on behalf of all of us, thank you. Now, to all of you, you've heard what Fred Gray has done and what he continues to do. Now you have an opportunity to support that work. I said at the outset, I've had the privilege of spending several hours at the Tuskegee History Center. It's a wonderful museum. It's well curated to tell the story of the pieces of the American Civil Rights Movement that occurred in Tuskegee, in Montgomery, and in Alabama. The History Center is, of course, a tribute to the victims of the uh, syphilis study, but it's more. Uh, the Center is building on its unique set of resources about those victims and their families to develop programs that are designed to address the enduring legacy of racism in the American healthcare system, and specifically the suspicion of Black Americans regarding programs like the COVID vaccines. This particular work of the center places it at the forefront of one of the critical ongoing public health policy challenges of our time. At the ceremony at which President Clinton apologized in 1997, Vice President Gore said, to this day, the Tuskegee study makes some Americans think twice about donating blood or taking their children for vaccinations or signing an organ donor card. It remains true today and it threatens the health of the African American community and thus of our nation. We have all heard about this throughout the pandemic. If you have ever asked yourself, what can I do? I have your answer. When Fred Gray speaks, <clears throat> ordinarily he does so in exchange for the host organization making a substantial contribution to the Tuskegee History Center. Now those contributions underwrite the center's work that extends far beyond Tuskegee. Ali does not pay its speakers. And this means every one of us who's been moved today by hearing from Fred has an opportunity I say a moral obligation to invest in the work of the center in the strongest possible terms. I urge you to do so. We're now gonna take a few minutes for some Q and A. And as I said, after which Fred will make some remarks, but during this time, we're gonna post a link to the Tuskegee Center where you can donate that links in the chat box. You can see it on the screen, <clears throat> please contribute. <clears throat> Now, now, Fred, 
There have been questions coming in via the chat box during the program. Uh, I'm uh, intrigued by one of them. Uh, somebody who wanted to know on a personal level, how did you have the patience to try all of these cases? Uh, uh, people picked up on the fact that these lawsuits don't get resolved within a week. Some of them go on for years. How'd you have the patience? Well, it, uh, it was a kind of easy way to do it. You just, you just sit there and wait. And you know, during the early stage of my practice, it was before you could even advertise. So you had to wait till people come to your office. And when they come in, you analyze the case. But um, many cases that I accepted went to some other lawyers who didn't accept them. For example, almost every lawyer in Tuskegee, somebody from Tuskegee Syphilis Study, they went to those lawyers. But they didn't see what I saw. And I think a part of that comes from the fact that I recognize that lawyers supposed to solve problems and we look for them. But it, uh, as I look back, I get tired. <laughs> and I guess I probably got tired as I was doing it also. Uh, so I know that people want to hear a little bit more about Dr. King. You talked about working with him, uh, but this was early in your career. It was early in his career. Tell us a little about a little bit about Dr. King as a person. What was he like? Well, he was really a, a easygoing person. If you didn't know who he were, and you came into an you know, uh, and he came into a room where you were, uh, whatever you were doing, he could simply join in. He wouldn't monopolize a conversation. You wouldn't realize that he could move people with words the way he does. And uh, he had a good sense of humor. He even believed in telling jokes, some of which he couldn't tell in the pulpit. So he was a great person. And one thing, however, on a serious note that's important now, and that is he believed truly in nonviolence and social change. He says that we have to change things, but fighting and riots is not it. We must do it nonviolently. And that's what he did throughout his life. Uh, people are interested in another figure whom you mentioned, a, shall we say, more problematic character in the history of the modern civil rights movement. You appeared before Judge Wa before George Wallace when George Wallace was a trial court judge. You then dealt with him when he was the governor. He was a virulent segregationist at one time. Many of us remember that part of our history. And the end of his time was a little different. What was your experience dealing with George Wallace? My experience with him when I first met him in Union Springs in 19, about 58, uh, in a little traffic case, uh, he always treated me with respect. I never had any problems with him. Uh, while he did not rule with me on the little case I had, he plays my client on uh, probation and uh, suspended the sentence. Then when he was a trial judge, he was still a trial judge down in Union, down in Eufaula. We tried a series of cases that involved moving blacks out, building a school in effect for whites and redeveloping the area and taking the black folks property. And uh, they uh, came down and I filed a lawsuit to try to stop the development, was unable to do it. They ended up eventually getting the property, but all white jurors down there provided to those uh, black persons that I represented a lot more money than what the property was worth. So while I wanted to appeal the case on principle, they say, well, lawyer, we got enough money to buy us another house. You got enough money to make some money on the case you thought we weren't gonna make any money on. 
So, uh, and George Wallace, I met again at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March because he wouldn't meet anybody or talk to anyone who was not a resident of the state of Alabama. And when he was got, got to the introductions, he got to me, so, oh, we know Fred. Mm -hmm. Says, uh, Fred, do you remember what you told me when you tried those cases on Flake Hill and your father? I said, well, your excellency, I told you so much, I'm not sure. I knew what he was talking about. <laughs> he said, you told me that he had treated me as fairly as any judge that I had tried any cases for. And that is correct. So Wallace went through that stage. He later went through a stage of when he was running for uh, presidency and the time it was segregation now, segregation forever. I looked at him when he was inaugurated and I said, well, for the next few years, we hope to keep you busy. And we did keep him busy. Then after he was shot, he changed and uh, was very repentant. And Blacks ended up helping to support him and getting him reelected again. So George Wallace went through a lot of things, but if you go back here when he was governor of Alabama, he did some things. He arranged it where there would be a community college in every community where students could stay at home and yet go to college. So he was a mix back to where of, of, of uh, containers, but in any event, he uh, helped to develop my law practice. Fred, we're coming to the end of our time together. I want to give you the last few minutes that we have, whether it's a closing sermon, a closing argument, however you wish. Please finish us up. First of all, Doug, let me thank you and Megan for what you've done and thank the college for having us. And thank my wife for working with me and helping to set all this up and thank Deborah for what she has done. And thank everybody else who had anything to do uh, with this program. As a teenager in Montgomery, I saw a problem that needed to be corrected. With a lot of help, including divine help and assistance, we have helped to change the landscape of America and assisted in the election and re-election of the 44th president and the 46th president to be of the United States. And we have helped to change some parts of the world. My first civil rights case, Claudette Carvin, as I told you about, was in 1955. It gave rise to Rosa Parks, enabled Dr. King to become an international figure. And not only that, it helped me to destroy everything segregated I could find. My career and these cases, as you know now, have been to eliminate racial discrimination in almost every aspect of American life, including but not living it to public transportation, vote, voting, protecting membership of organizations, the right in public education without discrimination, equal access to farm subsidies, health care, the right to serve on juries, and many others many of which you have seen here today and all just about of which you can see if you get a copy of Bus Ride to Justice. You have heard about the civil rights movement and that movement is, we have three generations who know nothing about hard coast segregation. So we invite you to visit the museum. Racism and inequality is still alive in this country, and that's what I've been fighting. The clock is still ticking, and the question is, where do we go? I'd like to leave you with something. If what I have said to you and what I have done during my 
career means anything. It means, unfortunately, that this country faces two major problems. One is racism and two is inequality. If the life and work of Dr. King and Congressman Lewis means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, particularly for women and for minorities. It means that we must continue to work for equality. It means that there is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have obtained will be continued or whether we will lose them. The struggle has not ended. Racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level playing field. There is no such thing as a neutral society in America. The consequences of 350 years of slavery, segregation, and discrimination has not disappeared in the last 65 years. Unfortunately, discrimination against African-American and other minorities is still alive well, and we should still be working and toward ending it. The question then before us, as we sit here, this Zoom program is, where do we go from here? So that we may have an impact, not only in your place of employment, but in the place where you live, where you work, I want to suggest to you three things. One, recognize that racism and inequality is alive and well and that they are wrong. When that declaration needs to come from the top, from the White House, the Congress, the United States Supreme Court, if the CEOs or major corporations the heads of our institutions of our learning, and if the heads of the federal governments and cities and state governments and counties and cities and states will all come out with a loud voice against racism and inequality and say it's wrong, that's the first step. The second step is to come up with a plan. In the Montgomery bus boycott, we saw the problem but then you have to have a plan. So we need to come up with a plan. Racism and inequality is not gonna go away by itself. We came up with a plan in Montgomery and each one of you need to do it. Third, a plan is no good unless you execute it. The plan must be executed. It should start from the top. It should with our president, with our Congress, with our uh, bar associations heads. And then in the final analysis, each one of us individually must do it. I want to leave you both young and old with a message that Congressman John Lewis, a great civil rights, nonviolent warrior, told me a few days before his death. When we had that conversation on July 8th, 2021, I asked a congressman, considering his great civil rights records, what is it that you would want me to do now that you may not be with us? And this is what he said, brother, keep pushing, keep going, set the record straight. So I say to Black, Black Lives Matter movement and to all persons interested in civil rights, keep pushing, keep going, set the record straight and do it all in a nonviolent manner. That's the way Dr. King did it. That's the way Congressman Lewis did. And let us do that until justice rolled down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you very much. Thank you for it all. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Fred Gray. <laughs>